In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33, verses 1 through 9, is some very interesting statements. And I believe God saw to it that these statements were literally put in the Bible so that at a certain point in history, either one, two, or a group of individuals, or maybe an entire church or a group of church organizations would act this part out. Starting in verse 1, again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say unto them, where I bring the sword upon a land, and I've been accused of being a bad mouth for the nation of America. We occasionally will have a letter or somebody will say that why don't we ever preach something good. I'm only discussing things about 666 instead of 777 when Christ returns. But I believe with all of my heart, at least when I was ordained and had hands laid upon me, one of the ministers prayed and said that, Ask God to set me apart for the ministry of prophecy. And I believe ever since then that has been happening. And that's why I believe that when God says, he, if someone sees a sword coming upon the land, look what he says. If the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, verse 3, if when he sees a sword come upon the land, he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whosoever hears the sound of the trumpet and takes not warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. So if there is indeed a warning going out to the nation of America that it is going under because of the national sins and that the sins of, of Israel, this nation before God has become full, then if anyone will not listen and repent, that person's blood is upon their own head, and no one else is responsible but he or she themselves. Verse 5, He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him, but he that takes warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman, and this is where the church or those individuals that God is going to send to blow this trumpet and sound the alarm, if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, if he does not stand up and speak what he knows to be true no matter what the people say, whether they'll listen or not, that's up to them. But that individual whom God has commissioned to do that must blow that trumpet, he must sound the warning, or else the blood of those people are going to be upon his head. This is Ezekiel chapter 33. I'm going to read verse 6 in its entirety. But if the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. Yes, that person is still a sinner and he's going to die for his own sins, but notice what God's going to do. But his, even a sinner's blood, will I require at the watchman's hand. Brethren, this trumpet must be blown. And the watchman must send forth the message that the United States of America is going to come tumbling down. <clears throat> Verse 7. So you, O son of man, I've set you a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die. If you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity but his blood will I require at your hand. I want it to go on record today that I'm going to blow the trumpet to anyone who will listen. I want them to know that this nation is in dire danger right now. In Isaiah chapter 58, Isaiah 58, God also instructs to the Israel once again that a trumpet must be blown. There must be a voice lifted up that would tell the nation of their sins. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. And a trumpet is piercing. And show my people their transgression. And the house of Jacob or Israel their sins. This must be a warning that something evil is about to transpire in the land of the United States of America. Someone must speak up and say that it's going to happen. Immediately after World War II, the United Nations organization was created. It was created to bring about, and this was designed from the beginning by the very phraseology of the Constitution of that organization. 
It was to bring about a socialist, communist world government with absolute dictatorial power over every person on the face of the earth. One of the very acts that was created right after that was established in 1945. Within three years was a, a treaty called the Genocide Convention Treaty. This treaty was brought before the Senate of the United States approximately every four to six years ever since 1948. And it has been totally vetoed every single time. Now this treaty was drawn up under the pretext of not allowing another Hitler to arise that would try to commit genocide or wipe out an entire race of people. This treaty has been rejected ever since 1948 by the Senate. But today, and I want to give the date, September 16, 1984, the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, has now called upon the Senate to bring this Genocide Convention Treaty out of committee and speedily pass it and become law in the United States of America. If this were to happen, what does this convention say and what would be the pretense or the, or the consequences upon the entire Christian community? I want to go through this word for word and try to help you understand the consequences if this genocide convention is passed. Article 1. The contracting parties confirm that genocide, and when you look up the word genocide in, an, in a dictionary, you'll see that it is a systematic killing of a people, or a nation, or a race of people. And yet as we go through this genocide convention, you're going to see that it expands it and means much more than just the word genocide. The word genocide is nothing but a front and a cover-up to divert the minds of people to make it appear as a wonderful doctrine for all of mankind. The contracting parties confirm that genocide, whether committed in time of peace or in time of war, is a crime under international law which they undertake to prevent and to punish. Now this seems innocent on the front. When you just read it word for word, this seems innocent, Article 1. But I want you to note something as we go through this. This Genocide Convention Treaty does not apply in any way to political genocide. Political genocide means if a nation becomes socialist or communist, then anyone who speaks out against the political order does not come under this convention. They can be systematically killed and they will not be punished under the Genocide Convention. The Soviets successfully deleted the word political from the treaty before they would sign it to become law for their land. Also, you have to understand that Lenin and every leader of the Soviet Union since that time has said you don't have to pay any attention whatsoever to any law or treaty that we make with the imperialist. They're like pie crusts to be broken. So this treaty will not affect them in any way. They'll not live up to it for one moment and yet, if this treaty is passed, it will supersede the Constitution of the United States, your Bill of Rights, and your Constitution protection against tyranny will be superseded by this genocide convention. The Soviets claim that the victim of their purges are enemies of the state, which puts them as a political enemy, and therefore they would be exempt from the genocide convention. And since their executions are for political reasons rather than national, ethnical, racial, or even religious reasons, the communists would be totally exempt from the genocide convention and any punishment that might be pursued. Article 2 of the genocide convention reads like this. In the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or part, a national, ethical, racial, or religious group. Okay, now think about this. Because this goes across a wide variety of uh, cases that could be brought before the world court. A, killing members of the group. This would be covered in the convention. Killing any members of a religious group, an ethnical group, a national group or a racial group, causing any of these groups 
serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. You see, it's not just killing physically and you're a dead person, but it can also be even mental harm. And what if you're a Buddhist and someone comes to you preaching the name of Jesus Christ? They can take you to court for causing them and their children mental harm and you can be convicted of genocide and you can be punished for it. But let's go on. C. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. So it not only says if you actually carry out the act of genocide, but even if they can show that you are calculating it in your mind, thinking it up, and maybe putting down a blueprint for some type of genocide covered in this convention. So you don't actually have to carry it out, but only the thought of it. D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. And yet, what is one of the things that is being promoted all over the world today? Birth control, abortion. And this is actually a way of committing genocide. And this is concluded within the framework of this treaty. E, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Now, I think we need to analyze this just a little bit. Article 2 makes it a crime even to cause mental harm to members of a group. Now, if you merely exercise the right of free speech, which we do on radio, television, the printing page, anyone can accuse you of causing them mental harm. No matter what member of a group they are, you can be accused of mental harm. And then you would be tried as a genocide criminal. Now, you may be tried in the United States of America, but not necessarily. Because if someone in a foreign country accuses you of genocide, they can actually take you to the world court in The Hague, in Holland. And then you can be tried there, and as far as you're concerned, you'd never be heard from again. Now, the forces of godless anti-Christ will haul every minister that evangelizes into court in this country. Because we will be accused of tr causing mental harm to other people, and especially to children. And you know why? Because many of the ministers today stand up in the pulpits and they say, if you don't accept Jesus today, if you die when you leave here in an automobile accident, you're going to burn forever in hell. And this is going to cause mental anguish and torment to individuals and to children alike. And therefore, they can sue you in the courts, any minister, and they can cause you to be convicted of genocide. Now, I believe just from that one statement, you can begin to see the consequences systematically destroying Christianity step by step under the phrase of mental harm. Well, let's go on to number three. Article number three of the Genocide Convention. The following acts shall be punishable. A, genocide, that is systematically killing a nation or a group of people. B, conspiracy to commit genocide. You don't even actually have to carry out the act, but even if someone accuses you of conspiracy, and let's face it, those within this antichrist system are liars because it says that Satan is their father and he was a liar from the beginning and they're liars and you just go into the court systems today and you'll find out that there is no fairness because they now control the court systems of the United States. You can be innocent and yet you'll be found guilty because they have infiltrated into every strata of society and they're the ones that totally control international socialism and communism to bring about a one world atheistic socialist communist government and impose it upon us. C, you can be punished for this, direct and public incitement to commit genocide. Even if you were to stand up and have a slip of the tongue of something which uh, President Reagan stated that we should bomb Russia, that would be, he could be hauled into court for genocide of the communist nation of Russia. 
just by inciting the public in some way to commit genocide, you could be hauled into court whether it actually came about or not. D, even if you attempt to commit so genocide, whether you carry it out or not. Now, look at number E, complicity in genocide. Now remember the various uh, uh, groups that genocide could be carried out against, religious groups, and it could even be mental harm toward these religious groups. So if you, as a parent, a husband, a wife, and you have children, in complicity in genocide, it simply means that you are an accomplice. So what happens if you and I are a minister of Jesus Christ and we're trying to fulfill the commission that Jesus gave us of going into all the world and preaching the gospel. And what if I am standing up on radio or television and I'm preaching and someone comes in and says, you are causing me mental harm. Or what if I'm doing it in secret as is done in the Soviet Union today and someone accuses you or me of mental harm towards someone else. Therefore, the wife or even the children are committing complicity. They are an accomplice. Why? Because they didn't go to the authorities and rat on you. They didn't turn, in, turn you into the authorities to let them know that you were committing religious genocide. Therefore, if they come and take you, they'll take the wife. They'll take the children who had access to that knowledge and imprison all of you and punish every single person. Now, why is this design, the word complicity, put in the Genocide Convention? I'll get to some scriptures and prophecy in a few minutes and you'll understand it. But the very, one of the reasons is to create division, not only in nations, but in families. Totally destroy every family on the face of the earth and separate and split them so there'll be no loyalty within not even nations, but even racial groups and even the family unit. That way children will turn in parents to save their own neck. Now, complicity is being an accomplice. That's what the, uh, Webster's Encyclopedia says. So just knowing someone is evangelizing and not reporting it to the officials makes you guilty under the Genocide Convention. And this is what it's designed for, to split everyone so that everyone will be against the other person. Brother against brother, husband against wife, mother against mother-in-law, daughter against mother, father against wife, children against their own parents. Total division, just like it is in the Soviet Union, so it's every person for themselves and there's no loyalty whatsoever. Well, let's go on to article number four. Persons committing genocide or any other acts enumerated, now remember this, not just the killing of someone or a nation or a racial group, but even any of the other acts enumerated in article three, which were complicity, and that's one of them, that's one of the acts, shall be punished whether they are constitutionally responsible rulers, whether it's the president, a member of the House of Representatives, or the Senate, whether it's a governor of a state, it doesn't matter. Public officials, or get this, private individuals. You can be hauled before the courts and convicted of genocide if you are in compliance with someone and you even know they're preaching Jesus Christ behind the scenes and if you don't report them. When they are hauled into court, you as an accomplice will be hauled into court and convicted with them. Now, Article 4 provides that private individuals can be prosecuted as criminals even though they are not government officials and have nothing to do with governmental action. The Soviets successfully defeated, de deleted the word, which I said before, with complicity, or they, de they deleted political out of this treaty. And they deleted from the text the words, with the complicity of government. They deleted that out also before it could be ratified by any nation. So it's not just complicity of government, but it's complicity of even private individuals. 
Because who is Satan's war against? It's against Christianity. That's the only design for this genocide convention because the Soviet Union is supplying the military equipment through revolutions, guerrilla warfare to overthrow every nation on the face of the earth. Now, except the Christian Western world, they're the ones that they haven't been successful in overthrowing militarily. So they must come in with a type of treaty knowing that their own agents have infiltrated into our government and they will carry it out. So they deleted the words with complicity of government and so it's even complicity of private individuals. So that the crime of genocide is defined as a personal action rather than just a governmental action. Now, Christians will be the first targets for religious genocide. You wait and see. Because Jesus gave the great commission found in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. And it reads like this, because Jesus wanted us to go into all the world, he wanted us to preach, and he said to every creature, every person, it doesn't matter where they live, Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go you therefore and teach all nations. And the actual Greek rendering where it says, teach all nations, should read, make disciples. So what are you doing when you make disciples of other nations? You are changing their mind from their present religious status to a different religious status. Therefore, you would be convicted of religious genocide. And then your parents, your relatives, anyone that is a Christian and they knows this is what you're doing, they are going to be convicted of complicity because they didn't turn you in. But we'll get to that in a minute. Verse 19, Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded to you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The word world is A-I-O-N, and the Greek means age, until the age when Christ returns. So this is the commission Christ has given to every Christian. And if we're going to follow this com commission, if we're going to be obedient to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to every word which he said to live by in Matthew 4.4, 4, then this genocide convention will be targeted at you and me, every one of us, before it will, nations. Now, in, Ma in Luke chapter 24, Luke 24, Jesus talking to the disciples again right before he ascended. And it's recorded like this in verse 45 to 47. Then Jesus opened their minds or their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Notice now Jesus was the one who had to open their understanding to scriptures. This is why the world is so deceived today. Their, their, minds, are not under, or their minds are not open to an understanding. And if Jesus, Jesus doesn't give the calling and the spiritual understanding, you're not going to comprehend scriptures. He said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead the third day. And this is what we're going to be preaching and tell people. And that repentance, now the word repentance means have an amendment of life. You change from certain activities you're engaged in and going the opposite direction, getting in harmony with every word of this book instead of the Buddhas, the Shintus, the Swahilis, and every other religion that is a part of the satanic system of this world. So when we tell people to repent, what are you doing? Under the genocide convention, you are committing religious genocide. And you can be hauled into court. This is designed to shut down Christianity and to divide all of Christianity one against another. So we're to go and we're to see, say, repent. And remission of sin should be preached in Jesus' name. And if people believe in Buddha and all of the other isms in the world today, they're not going to believe in the name of Jesus. And when you and I present his name and we tell them with no qualifications to it that nobody will be saved and receive salvation unless they bend their knees to the name of Jesus, then what are we going to be? 
who are going to be brought up before the courts under the genocide convention and say you are religiously committing genocide because you're causing mental harm to all of these people by saying they are lost unless they accept Jesus. Well, I believe this is a reality based upon everything that we've seen the Soviet Union has passed into law through the United Nations organization. Now, article number five, the contracting parties, and this is that person who uh, files lawsuit against an individual or a group, and then the other party who has the lawsuit against them, the contracting parties undertake to enact in accordance with their respective constitutions, so this would be every nation on the face of the earth, we will enact under our constitutions the necessary legislation to give effect to the provisions of the present convention, the way it's written right here, with no changes, and in particular to provide effective penalties for persons guilty of genocide or any of the other acts enumerated in Article 3. It always goes back to Article 3 because, you see, they don't want it to just be genocide, actually murder of a racial group or a whole national population. They want to make sure it's complicity even in religion. Now, Article 5 literally pledges that the United States government will enact the necessary legal legislation to carry out the terms of punishment not only against governmental officials, but against private, in, uh, private individuals. Now, when legislation is therefore considered by Congress, we'll be told that we must pass it in order to keep our word, because after all, we're a Christian nation. And when we swear to something, which we're not supposed to do at all, but when you say yes or no, and you put your signature on a convention, then you're bound to that. See, the communists always use that. They say uh, promises are like pie, pie crust to be broken, so they don't keep any of their promises. But we as a Christian nation, they say, you're not very Christian because you're not keeping your promises. So what do we do? Immediately carry out every word of the convention that we have said we would. Well, what you have to understand is that this treaty, once it's passed, it becomes international law superseding the Constitution of the United States and our Bill of Rights that protects us from tyranny and protects us from government. So what we're doing is by signing this, if it passes the Senate of the United States, we will then become world citizens, which Governor Walker of the state of Illinois has already signed that all Illinois people are world citizens. He did that several years ago. Well, let's go on to Article 6. Persons charged with genocide or any other acts enumerated in Article 3. Every time it goes back there to lock in complicity. Shall be tried by a competent tribunal of the state in the territory of which the act was committed. So that could be our country, the United States. But notice the next phrase or by such international penal tribunal as may have jurisdiction with respect to those contracting parties which shall have accepted jurisdiction. So we could be tried in foreign courts. So this actually states, this is providing that persons accused of these crimes can be tried by an international penal tribunal where they would not have the protection of United States Bill of Rights, we would not have, or we would not have to have a grand jury, jury indictment in order to try us. We would not have the right to a speedy or a public trial by an impartial judi jury, which our Constitution guarantees every citizen. But all of this would be superseded, and we would have no rights, no trial but jury. It would be tried by an international penal tribunal. And let's face it, every tribunal behind the uh, Iron Curtain, you never hear what happens to these people. They're usually sent at hard labor to Siberia in their slave labor camps, or else they're just executed by the millions. Well, you would not have the Fifth Amendment 
of the Constitution to hide behind. Because you see, according to the Fifth Amendment, you do not have to testify against yourself. You do not have to admit that you allegedly committed the crime of genocide, whether it's religious genocide or any other part of this treaty. So the privilege against self-incrimination would be totally abolished under this international law. The protection against unreasonable searches would be totally abolished. The right of habeas corpus would be totally abolished. And the right not to be denied life or liberty without due process of law would be totally denied, which our Constitution presently gives us. Now, this Article 6 throws you on the mercy of the United Nations World Court, and I have proven in the booklet, November 1983, about the United Nations, that it is an arm of the Antichrist Communist World Conspiracy for World Government that is rising, and Revelation chapter 13 states that it will rise here in the end time. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. And of course, the setting of this book is the very end of the age. Revelation 1.1 1, 1 and verse 10 shows that it will be at the end of the age. Revelation 13.1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. And you go on down and you see that it does have ten crowns, ten horns and ten crowns, and he has the name of blasphemy. And then in verse 2, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet like, were as the feet of a bear. And his mouth is the mouth of a lion, so it had all the strong parts of every world government that had preceded it. And the dragon gave him his power, so this is Satan the devil, and his seat and great authority. And when you look down into verse 7, you see that it is going to be a world ruling government. And if this genocide convention is passed, here is what is going to happen. And it, this beast, which is coming out to be international world socialism, was given unto him to make war with the saints. Because you see, of political genocide by our preaching the commission Jesus Christ gave us. And when we mentally harm other people by trying to convert them to Christianity, then they have every right to make war against us through the genocide convention. Well... Let's go on to Article 7 of the Convention. Genocide and the other acts enumerated in Article 3 shall not be considered as political crimes for the purpose of extradition. No political crime. Wow. The contracting parties pledge themselves in such cases to grant extradition in accordance with their laws and treaties in force. So, this genocide is not political. How much clearer can it be? It, gives the do it opens the door so the Soviet Union can continue to trample down the earth all over the world. And yet, it can totally destroy Christianity by mental harm and political or religious genocide. So, if we agree to Article 7 by agreeing that genocide is not a political crime, this takes away our right to protect American citizens from extradition to a foreign country. Anyone could make an accusation against a United States citizen, a private citizen, as well as a governmental, someone in governmental authority, and you could be extradited to a foreign country stand trial in that country under the Genocide Convention without trial by jury. Now, how far do you think a Christian is going to get under this anti-Christ system that is taking place today? The enemies of Christianity within our own country, such as the humanists, the atheists, the socialists, the communists, they will go down the line and begin to accuse you and me and every minister that appears on radio, television, or writes a booklet or pamphlet of religious genocide. And they'll haul us into the courts just like they have done to get prayer out of schools. This is reality. This is happening today. And it'll be those same individuals that will haul us into court. Look at Matthew chapter 10. Jesus is talking about the end of the age here. And he was talking to his disciples. He said, look, fellas, 
I've called you to a very serious commission. That's why he said in Luke 16, or, or I forget which chapter it is, I, I think it's 16, he said count the cost, or maybe it's Luke 14. Count the cost of becoming a Christian. Make sure you know what you're doing because I'm going to send you as sheep, defenseless sheep, out into wolves and they're going to devour you. But in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 to 25, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be you therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they'll deliver you up to the councils. And isn't this exactly what the genocide convention will do to us for religious genocide? And they will scourge you in their synagogues. And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. And when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you will speak. For it will be given you in that same hour what you will speak. For it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaks in you. Supernatural power, if this happens and this genocide convention takes place and you and I are hauled into court, God's going to be there and he's going to see to it that we know what to say as a witness against them, not to convert them, but as a witness that their deeds are evil. Verse 21, and look at the ramifications of this because this genocide convention just makes this pop right off the page. Verse 21 of Matthew 10, and the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. Why? Because you're an accomplice. If you don't turn in your brother for preaching Christ in secret underground, then you can be hauled into court. And so in order to protect your own skin, you'll turn in your brother and the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Why? Because you, mom and dad, are preaching to other people Jesus. And that is religious genocide. So I don't want to be an accomplice and I don't want to be put to death with you so I'll turn you in to the authorities. Verse 22. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endures to the end shall be saved. That's either the end of this age when Christ returns or to the end of your life if you're put to death. But when they persecute you in this city, flee you to another. And look at the time setting. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. This is it. The end of the age, right before Christ returns, going over the cities of Israel and saying, look, the genocide convention is going to pass. If this nation is coming under judgment, it will pass. And therefore, this is what's going to happen to our great country. There won't be any more loyalties among family members, among church members, because you're going to be out to save your own skin. But you see, I want to read you another scripture right quick. Because God knows what we're doing. And one of the great tests of his true people are whether we love each other or not. And in Malachi, the very last book of the Old Testament, it's talking about the end of the age. In chapter 3, first verse, he says, Before that great day comes, the day of the Lord, he's going to send someone to prepare a way. And we know that John the Baptist was the first one. And then he's going to send somebody else at the end of the age to prepare the second coming of Christ. Then down in verse uh, 16, because God indicts the nation by saying, well, what good is it to serve you? In vain is it to serve you, verse 14. And we've kept your ways, and what good's it done? Because you see, when this genocide convention comes in, if it does, then it's going to divide this nation religiously, individually, husband against wife, parents against children, and every one of us are going to be running so scared We'll be afraid to breathe the name of Jesus because you'll be hauled into court for religious genocide. And as a mate or children of that family, you're going to be afraid too. And so he says, what good does it do to serve you? Then in verse 16, then they that feared or stood in awe of the Lord, and this is the Lord Jesus Christ, spoke often one to another. That might be us, just little groups, little pockets of individuals here and there underground not out in public. And the Lord hearkened, or he listened and he heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. 
weren't afraid to speak Jesus. And they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. The word jewel should be properly translated special treasure. Special treasure. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son that served him. Then shall you return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serves God and him that serves him not. So you and I are going to be spared a lot of things because God is going to look down upon us. And then when we receive our glorified body, we're going to return and we're going to discern and bring judgment with Jesus Christ in this earth between the righteous and the wicked. That's going to be a tremendous honor. We shouldn't take it lightly. Well, let's go on to Article 8. There's only nine articles in this particular treaty. Article 8, any contracting party, that's any nation now, that is going to have a part of this agreement may call upon the competent organs of the United Nations to take such action under the Charter of the United Nations as they consider appropriate for the prevention and suppression of acts of genocide or any of the other acts enumerated in Article 3. What we're literally doing by accepting this article, we are inviting the United Nations organization to supersede the government and the armed forces of the United Nations would literally be able to come in to this country even if there was a thought or a suspicion of genocide and their armed forces could come into this nation and occupy it. I have seen a map where the United Nations has drawn up a map of the entire world. They already have assigned to every country in the world, and the United States is broken down into five districts. And the military forces of foreign nations are assigned to our country. Our soldiers that would be a part of the peacekeeping forces of the United Nations would be assigned to another nation. No nation's national forces could occupy its own country. And there is a reason for that. Once again, divide and conquer. Now, if there were to be an insurrection in the United States against this particular treaty, do you think our own soldiers would shoot our own people? Oh, no, but if you bring somebody from China or another communist nation and put it in a Christian nation, they would have no qualms with shooting down someone of another race in order to stop any insurrection. And this is what this is designed for. The United Nations organization can come in and occupy any nation where there is even a suspicion that they may not be or that they may carry out some type of genocide. And it doesn't matter because remember it referred back to Article 3 again. Even religious genocide. And so that once again opens the gate for total world occupation by United Nations forces. Number nine, this is the last part of this treaty. Disputes between the contracting parties relating to the interpretation, application, or fulfillment of the present convention, including those relating to the responsibility of a state for genocide, or any of the other acts enumerated in Article 3, every time it refers back to Article 3 and not just genocide, the killing of a nation, shall be submitted to the International Court of Justice at the request of any of the parties to the dispute. What happens if we wanted to settle a dispute within the borders of the United States? Any one of these parties can ask to go to the International Court of Justice and by law, if we accept this convention, it will have to be done. You and I can be extradited to the Hague the world court and be tried in a foreign country. No jury, none of our peers, no protection as I've enumerated before under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. So Article 9 takes away the United States' right to decide the interpretation or the application of the convention and it throws it right into the lap of the United Nations World Court, International Court of Justice. It provides that any of these disputes about its interpretation should be submitted to the international court upon the request of any of the parties. So you know that those who are behind the International Socialist Movement for World Government is going to bring up a suit and they're not going to allow our own government in this country to decide it. 
They're going to go and get the decision from their own organization, which they created, they built, and they're using to promote a one world government. So now, under the United Nations Genocide Convention, individual American citizens can be accused of crimes and shipped overseas. And they would be tri stand tri trial in a foreign court where the Bill of Rights will not protect us. Now, I think this is important for us to understand. Now, I've given you some of the effects so far of the Genocide Convention or the treaty, the way it could cause a certain um, amount of anguish and trouble in the Christian community. But now, I want to read a letter which I have sent this is the official letter that has been sent by the Church of God Evangelistic Association to every senator in the United States of America, and a letter will be going to Mr. Ronald Reagan also to have them to stop this matter of the Genocide Convention. Here it is. A matter of dire consequence to the integrity of the Constitutional Republic of the United States of America has come to my attention today. President Reagan is endorsing the Genocide Convention Treaty and urging the Senate to ratify it speedily. I am requesting that you vote no. This treaty would cause us to give up our rights as individuals, states, and nation now guaranteed by our Constitution and Bill of Rights. International law would become supreme law of our land. This is unthinkable. I urge you to reread the statements by Senator Strom Thurmond and Robert M. Bartell of Liberty Lobby on pages 8 and 78 respectively of the hearing on the Genocide Convention before the Committee of the Foreign Relations, United States Senate, 97th Congress, December 3, 1981. They spoke out against this and they proved conclusively that this convention would destroy our constitutional republic. Now I'll go ahead with a letter. I also want you to note that on the committee were the following men who are members of the Council on Foreign Relations and or the Trilateral Commission. Howard Baker Jr., Jr., Council on Foreign Relations. Charles Mathias Jr., Council on Foreign Relations. Claiborne Pell, Council on Foreign Relations. John Glenn, former astronaut, hero, Council on Foreign Relations. Paul S. Sarbanes, Council on Foreign Relations. Alan Cranston, Trilateral Commission. It is equally important to realize that each of these men voted to give away the Panama Canal. And that was one of the 45 points of the communists that they were trying to do within the United States, give away the Panama Canal. Now, I'll continue the letter. Now they want to supersede the sovereignty of our constitutional republic, which must not be allowed. The purpose of the Council on Foreign Relations is to destroy United States sovereignty. Its goals are to bring America into a one world government. The Council on Foreign Relations was founded in 1919 by Edward Mandel House, who had been chief advisor to President Woodrow Wilson. In his book, Philip Drew Administrator, House laid out a fictionalized plan for the conquest of America. He told of a conspiracy which would gain control of both Democratic and Republican parties and use them as instruments in creating a socialist world government. The book called for a passage of a graduated income tax and for the establishment of a state-controlled central bank as steps toward the ultimate goal. Both of these pro proposals are planks of the Communist Manifesto, and both became law in 1913, during the very first year of the House-dominated Wilson administration. The April 1974 issue of Foreign Affairs, a quarterly journal of the Council on Foreign Relations, there is a very explicit recommendation for bringing about the world government scheme of Council on Foreign Relations founder Edward Mandel House. Authored by State Department veteran and Columbia University professor Richard N. Gardner, who is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, under his article, The Hardcore to a World Order, here's what he says. He admits that a single leap into a world government by an organization like the United Nations is unrealistic. Instead, Gardner urged the continued piecemeal delivery, piece by piece, 
of our national sovereignty to a variety of international organizations. He called for, and I quote, an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, end of quote. That means an end to our nation's sovereignty. It is high treason. The Trilateral Commission has the same basic goals as the Council on Foreign Relations. Two of its founders were Jimmy Carter and Zygmunt Brzezinski. Brzezinski is a promoter of Marxism in the form of communism. In his book, Between Two Ages, he proposes, quote, deliberate management of the American future with the planner as the key social legislator and manipulator, end of quote. He discusses America's shortcomings and then writes, quote, America is undergoing a new revolution which unmasks its obsolescence. I hotly disagree with that. America is not obsolete. In essence, he is saying the Constitution is obsolete. He suggests a piecemeal movement toward a, quote, community of nations under the United Nations through a variety of indirect ties and already developing limitations on national sovereignty, end of quote. See pages 198, 260, and 296 of his book. On page 308 of his 309-page book, he lets the reader know what he really wants, and I quote, the goal of world government, end of quote. Can there be any doubt that we must not ratify the Genocide Convention Treaty? It is a manipulated step toward the destruction of our beloved United States Constitutional Republic. As of, matter of, as of urgent matter, as Election Day approaches, is a need to remind President Ronald Reagan of these things, as well as the fact that all of his advisors that are appointed are either Council on Foreign Relation or Trilateral Commission members, or both, and that includes Vice President Bush. This needs to be rectified by appointing solid core constitutionalists at every level of government. And I signed it respectfully yours, David J. Smith, and then I added a PS. This treaty totally eliminates political genocide from its language and intent therefore allowing the Soviet Union to continue to systematically commit political genocide against every nation which they overthrow. This is unthinkable. Do not pass this document. Now, what is the real design behind this hideous treaty? Remember, Satan is behind it because he's giving rise to this end-time government. And I've got two just basic points. Number one, his tactic is to divide and conquer the American people. I mean down to the very family unit, to where husband be against wife, children against the parents. Now in Matthew 24, verse 9 and 10, Jesus prophesied of the things that would be occurring right before the end of the age, as this world government was giving rise. Verse 9 and 10, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake, and then shall many be offended. Many who claim to be Christians today, and they say all there is is love, love, love. You don't have to obey God. All you have to do is love each other. When reality sets in, these will be the first ones to be offended because they've never disciplined themselves to learn absolute obedience to their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And they'll betray one another and even shall hate one another. This is going to become reality. Now in Mark 13, the parallel scriptures, Mark 13, verse 9, then verse 12 and 13. Verse 9, and this adds a little more in each of these scriptures. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues you shall be beaten, and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my name's sake for a testimony against them. Then look at verse 12 and 13. Now the brother shall betray the brother to the death, and the father the son. So even parents who give up on Christianity and betray their own children, and children shall rise up against their parents and what? Turn them in 
because of religious genocide and shall cause them to be put to death. And you, New Testament Christians, shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Why? Because you're not accepting the new world order and the new Messiah, which will be coming out of Jerusalem and establish his headquarters as a world government, the false kingdom of God, the Antichrist system. And he'll be required, he'll require worship of himself as the Messiah. But here's the good thing. He that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. You see, they can't take salvation from you. Now Luke 21 adds just a little more to this. Luke 21, verse 12 to 18. But before all these, and these are the signs, and the sermon I gave on the black horse of the apocalypse showed how earthquakes and famines would come, and this would be the beginning of sorrows. And right after this begins to happen, and we've already seen that it will. And the October of 1984, Newswatch magazine will give an entire section on the black horse of the apocalypse. When these things start happening, before all these, they shall lay their hands on you, and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. It shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate what you'll answer. Verse 15, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries, the Antichrist system, shall not be able to gainsay nor to resist. And you shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren, and kinsfolk, and friends. It even goes further. And some of you shall call, they cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not an hair of your head perish. See, they can kill the flesh, but they can't take your salvation, God's Holy Spirit, out of you. And the minute Jesus returns and that resurrection occurs, your spirit and they can't take it away from you. Well, the second thing that this genocide convention will do is create the tactic of fear in every person. Every person living under it will have terror of being caught for religious genocide. Individuals out of fear to save their own skin will become secret informers on one another just like it is in the Soviet Union and every communist country everywhere in the world. That's why it says in their last 100 year program called the Minutes of the Meeting or the Protocols that they would have secret spies all over so that no one could say anything that they wouldn't know about because all your own family members, friends at work will turn you in. This le legislation, if passed by the Senate of the United States, would divide every family in the world, mother against father, children against parents, etc., right on down the line, because of the phrase concerning complicity. And if you just knew that a parent, husband, wife, friend, neighbor, anyone, someone you worked with, was preaching Jesus Christ in secret to convert someone on the grounds of religious beliefs to another doctrine of Jesus Christ, you would become an accomplice to religious genocide. This is the exact same system that is in effect in the Soviet Union today, and it's the same system that gives the state total control out of fear, just like certain religions today rule out of absolute fear. So the ultimate results of this genocide convention, if it is passed, is prophesied in the book of Amos. The book of Amos in the Old Testament, and this is a very startling section when you read it, and it just jumps off the page when you understand the genocide convention and its implications. Amos 8, verse 11 and 12. Behold, the days come, and I believe they're just leaping off the pages of Bible prophecy as a reality that I will send a famine in the land. Now, God isn't sending it. He's allowing Satan and his end-time government to do it, but God said he's allowing it, so he's responsible. So he'll rectify the situation when the right time comes. He says, I'll send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst. It's not going to be physical famine of food, but of hearing the words of the Lord. 
and they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. it this genocide convention, because of the religious complicity within it, it will actually result in a total blackout, just like New York City had two blackouts. Only this time it will be a blackout of Christian evangelism through radio, magazines, and TV, and any other written literature. Brethren, we are now very close to the prophesied beast world government. Our beloved constitutional republic that is guaranteed the greatest freedom on the face of the earth to worship God, increase in business activity, and send evangelism around the world is about to see the sun set upon it. Unless every single person in this country, every person as a nation, repents and turns back to God's everlasting covenant. Now the last scripture for today is 2 Chronicles 7 verse 14. If every single person in this country would repent and turn back to God's everlasting covenant, and before you can do that, you must learn what it is so that you can turn back to it. If they would, this is what God would do for this land. But if this doesn't happen, this world government will take place and God will destroy the holy people, as he says in Daniel chapter 12, verse 7. If my people, which are called by my name, and the United States of America was declared to be a Christian nation February 29, 1892, by a nine-nothing decision of the Supreme Court of the United States, if they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, and I'll inject to God's everlasting covenant that determines what sin is, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land.